Hey everybody, this is Scholar Jun of Mojang Dan Bing. Today we're going to talk about the Double Dragon Sui Dao from LK Chen. So before we jump in, I should say a couple things first. Number one, this sword was sent to me on a loan to make a couple videos about, and then I eventually have to send it back. And two, because of that, I'm not going to be doing like a full-blown review and a bunch of cutting with this sword. But I will tell you about you know, the history and how it feels in the hand and what I think of it. Let's get right into it. Now, the Double Dragon Sui Dao has been offered by LK Chun for a while, but this one is kind of new because, as you can tell, it's got a black scabbard. And before it had like a rosewood scabbard, and I think that making the scabbard black along with the grip really adds to the feel and the aesthetic of this sword. And let's start by talking about what the sword is named for, which is the ring pommel. In the past, I've talked about ring pommels, and basically said that even though certain dynasties may have had a use for ring pommels, we don't know for sure, but they may have like, you know, hung weapons on the wall with the ring pommel or something like that. Uh, if we take a look at this ring pommel, it becomes fairly obvious that ring pommels don't always have to have a utilitarian function. And in fact, this ring pommel is very decorative. And it has this common Chinese motif called the Shuang Long Xi Zhu, or the two dragons chase or play with the pearl. And what's cool about this ring pommel and the sword in general is that it's based off an artifact found in the Met in New York. For a long time, Chinese swords weren't always based off real artifacts or antiques. They were just kind of imagined, particularly in earlier periods, like the Han and the Tang. But uh, beginning kind of with LK Chen and now more and more people are doing it where you actually reference the actual artifacts and antiques which is super important if you ever want to become close to actually replicating one and how it feels and is used. If we continue by looking at the grip we can see that the tang is secured onto the handle scales by means of these rivets going through these floral motifs and that's a super secure really aesthetic way in my opinion to mount the handles onto the sword and on the other side we have this tassel. This has caused a little bit of controversy online because there's actually two versions of this sword. One of them has a shorter handle and the shorter handle is a little is actually the proper size based off the antique but LK Chun felt that having the handle that short would make it uncomfortable to hold because your hand would be bumping up against this protrusion that has the tassel on it. So he elected to lengthen the handle slightly and allow for you know people to have a really ample room for gripping. You might be wondering why they put this on here and I actually want to shout out to another channel called Sync Point who also does some videos on Chinese sword stuff. You know he hasn't posted in a while. Let's hope he comes back. He um, he made a video on this sword and he said that this protrusion is probably there so that you can show off your fancy tassel whenever you're wearing it because if you're wearing the sword it's going to be mounted like this a little, little lower but it'll be mounted kind of like this and this way you can show off your flashy bling basically <laughs> and uh, I really I think that's probably the perfect explanation. Sync Point also was able to get a hold of a and the other model of this sword which has a shorter handle and he felt that his hand could still fit onto it without you know interfering with the with the tassel attachment so I think that you know maybe the person had slightly smaller than average hands and it was really comfortable for them to just grip it right here. I think it'd be interesting to try out uh, a model of this sword with a shorter handle just to see the difference. Whenever we get down to the grip we also find something really interesting. So for a long time people assumed that this was a Sui Dynasty doll uh, because of where it was buried and the Sui Dynasty was you know in the late 6th century they unified China and when it was had been broken up for a while but they were quickly you know usurped and conquered by the Tang. There's a little contention with this guard because there's at least one scholar in China who argues that this guard shape, which is kind of like a cross guard, actually came from the western regions. And according to his argument, the this sword is actually not from the Sui dynasty, but is actually a Tang dynasty doll, which would just be a, you know, a century later or so. One reason that that theory is interesting is because we know for a fact that the scabbard attachments do come from the west. In particular, these things here, they're sometimes called ears because they're kind of like ears, you know, hanging off the, the scabbard. And these come straight from Sassanid Persia. So we know that there's already features from the west coming into this sword. And Sync Points also talked about how we have Buddhist elements in the, you know, the aesthetic of the sword because originally a lot of these fittings were gold and silver and 
Okay, Chen's elected not to do gold and silver because that's, you know, prohibitively expensive for most people, and he's done brass and bronze. But the fact is, is that this sword itself already has a lot of signs which, you know, indicate that it has a lot of Western influence. I mean, by Western, I mean like Central Asia and stuff. So because of that, uh, I don't think it's highly unlikely that this guard also might come from the Western regions, and therefore this might be a Tang Dynasty doll. Another interesting thing about the guard is that on the ends it has this what's called a yunto or a cloud head motif. Now let's look at the blade. One of the first things you notice when you pull it out of the scabbard is that this blade has a tunko or habaki. And in the past in China, you know, tunko existed as far back as the Han Dynasty, but they didn't really catch on and become super popular until the Song Dynasty. So they definitely had them on some Tang Dao but they were not as uh, common as they are on later periods. Like many LK Chun blades, this sword has a nice pattern welded steel where you can see like a grain in the steel and it always looks aesthetically pleasing. Another thing about LK Chun swords that's really good is that he doesn't overdo the acid etch. So he etches it slightly just to bring out some of that contrast in the blade, but it's not even close to overdone like some people will do. So it looks like steel, but at the same time, if you look close enough, you can see like a grain to it. It should be noted that the original in the Met uh, is still in its scabbard, and no one dares take it out because the scabbard would pretty much disintegrate off of it then. It's really rare for, you know, organic material like wood to last over a thousand years, and no one wants to mess with it, and the blade is probably rusted really badly anyways. So we don't know exactly what the blade looks like, even though we have a pretty good idea of what the handle looked like on this sword. And LK Chun's elected to go with this blade that has a nice chisel grind on it, which can be really resilient. I should say there's been a few people who have expressed skepticism about the existence of the chisel grind blade during the Tang Dynasty. However, there, we do have some blades housed in Horuji in Japan, which were, you know, supposedly sent there by the Tang Dynasty. And if those blades are indeed are Tang Dynasty originals and they haven't been, you know, ground or tampered with, then the chisel grind is a completely historically accurate design for a Tang Dynasty sword. I should say that quite a few published authors that I've read all agree that these are represent that the swords housed in Horuji are representative of actual Tang blades. As to what it's good for, I believe that the chisel grind is a way to make a pretty resilient blade. And you'll see that even though this blade is quite narrow, it also has a pretty thick spine. And because of its thick spine, that means that uh, it's actually quite stout. And it has quite a bit of heft and momentum to it. Now we get to this interesting question of handling. And some people have commented that the shorter handle actually feels, you know, easier and better to wield than the blade with the longer handle. Which seems counterintuitive because a lot of the time a longer handle will bring the point of balance closer to the hand. And it will make the blade easier to move around. But what I think is happening here, now I haven't handled the, the blade with the shorter handle, but I can tell that this sword moves in a, kind of strangely. For instance, I noticed that if I have the sword out and I drop the tip down, it doesn't drop down as quickly as a sword that might be lighter than this blade. And what I believe that is due to is because the mass in this handle is actually, you know, it takes a lot of inertia to get this handle moving. And I think that that resistance to inertia is what's you know, keeping this blade from falling down and spinning around as fast as a blade that's just, uh, even the lighter blade would spin. However, with this longer handle, I actually find that I can do a two-handed grip fairly comfortably, so I don't really think it's much of an issue. And even though it does feel different than many of the other swords I've handled, you have a long blade and you have quite a bit of mass. However, I should say that this kind of tassel is probably just for decoration and it might look really cool, but if I was really gonna be, you know, fighting with this sword, I'd try to take it off probably. In summary, I think that this sword is a pretty good representative of what in the Tang Dynasty would be called an Yi Dao. So Yi Dao is like a ceremonial Dao and basically it's these fancier, higher level Dao that would be worn to court and, you know, to show off your wealth and status. So that, that's kind of the role that this fulfills. It's not necessarily like a utilitarian blade, but it has all the bells and whistles that someone would want if they're going to go to court. All right, that's all for this video. As always, please subscribe and don't forget to stay sharp.